Romans 8 and Romans 8. Okay, Ecclesiastes 8, verse 12. This is Solomon uh, telling us that you, if you're trying to figure out the work of God uh, in your life or on the earth, uh, you might as well give up because you're not going to figure it out. Okay, the work of God here. Okay, now the work of God in eternity, that one we can figure out. Okay, Ecclesiastes 8, 12. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged... Yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. Okay, so the writer is saying, okay, if a bad man, he gets good. By a good man, he gets bad. He says, I know one thing. In the end, the guy that fears God is going to win. But it shall not be well with the wicked, neither shall, be, shall he prolong his days, which are a shadow, because he feareth not before God. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this is also vanity. Okay, so this is like the age-old question, why do good people suffer? 15, then I commended mirth, and because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of all of his labor the days of his life which God giveth him under the sun. When I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done under the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes, then I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. Okay, trying to limit life to under the sun. And this is because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man shall think, think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. Okay, so that's trying to figure out some things that's going on down here about God's inner workings. Okay, Romans chapter 8. And we're going to spend most of the time in Romans. Paul's epistle to the Romans. And after eight chapters, he draws a conclusion, and this conclusion is verse 37. And the conclusion will be a threefold victory for the believer. Now, not a threefold victory of the believer. Actually, we're not doing anything to do, get the victory. It's a victory that God has available for the believer. Romans eight thirty-seven. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand your words, and I pray that this would be a help and encouragement. I pray that you'd bind unclean spirits, that they cannot hinder it, that the spirit would have liberty, and the uh, word of the Lord would have free course. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, in the Romans 8.37, this is the conclusion of Paul after eight chapters he wrote to this church. Okay, he's talking about the state of man and then the state of the believer. Okay, the idea is to conquer sin and self that is available to every believer based upon the finished work of God. In Romans chapter 8, Paul said, or Romans chapter 6, Paul said this about the work of God. Romans 6 verse 28, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto him, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Okay, that's God's work. That's a victory that is available for every single believer. Okay, it's not that the believer has to do uh, as far as to uh, strive to get the victory. No, the victory 
is available. Now, the work of God under the sun can be very perplexing uh, to anybody, obviously, especially when one lacks faith. Okay, now this threefold victory comes in, uh, in three doctrinal terms. Now, in the church today, they don't know these terms. They won't discuss these terms. Anything more than five letters is really outside of their vocabulary nowadays in the church. Okay, these are terms that end in I-O-N. They're doctrinal terms. Justification is one. Sanctification is one. And glorification is one. And then you have other ones, propitiation, redemption, things like that. But all three of these are uh, victories that are available to every believer. Justification, sanctification, and glorification in that order. Okay, justification is a legal decree of a judge. You see the word justification is a jury, a judge, judgment, okay, and to adjure somebody, things like that. A justification is it's a legal de- decree... When the eternal judge declares somebody free of sin, it's a decree. Okay, like at birth, your name's written in life. Okay, the book of life, probably. Okay, as far as that goes. Uh, and then uh, with that idea, God starts keeping accounts and records in heaven. And then uh, when we get to the age of accountability or we know good from evil, then he starts giving on our account all our sins. Justification is God taking that account and cleaning it out. It's like hitting control A, highlighting them all, delete, they're gone. Justification. Romans 5 verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, sanctification is also similar. It's a legal act also of the believer to be free from sin. Okay, justification is when you're free of sin. Sanctification is a legal act where you're free from sin. This is available to every believer. Romans 6 basically writes about that, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Okay, glorification is an extradition. Or translation of the believer to be free from the world, the flesh and the devil, and you're like Christ. Okay, that's what glorification is. That's that's when uh, the rapture takes place. We're glorified. Okay, those three terms are victories that are available for every single individual. It's like it's like the light switch. As soon as they hit the light switch, uh, whatever it is that triggers justification. Okay, you got that. And then there's a light switch of sanctification. Okay, that's, that's coming. And then glorification, that one is the one that God controls the light switch. When he says you're coming up. Those are the three terms. And that's what I want to work on this morning. It's a threefold victory of the believer that is available to everybody. Okay, the first thought is this, Romans, the book of Romans. So if you're in Romans, we'll start and kind of skim down through there. Romans reveals the victory provided for the sinner by faith in the Savior. Okay, that's what's provided. Okay, in Romans 8, you'll see in verse 18, Romans 1.18, the wrath of God. Okay, the sinful man is under the wrath of God. He's under that wrath. Now, it starts in Romans 118, this runs all the way through chapter 3, verse 19, where you see the conclusion in chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Okay, so that's, that's where man is, right there. Now, if you go backwards, uh, chapter 1, if you're in 18, go backwards to verse 1, or verse 16, you'll see what's offered. Okay, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Okay, so there's salvation. Notice salvation is based upon belief. Justification. The trigger, the light switch, is belief in Jesus Christ. 
And then it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So this is dealing with life after justification. So in verse 17, we're dealing with sanctification. Now, what is faith to faith? Is that Old Testament, New Testament? You don't really know. Uh, it appears to me that from faith, justification by faith, to sanctification by faith. Okay, where both of them are dealing with our lives on the earth, where glorification is God empowering us. So the portion where we're at is from faith, justification, to faith, sanctification, then we live by faith. Okay, faith provides justification to faith, which provides sanctification. That's what's available to us. Okay, 118, wrath, that's bad. Chapter 3, verse 19, guilty. Okay, but that victory is available to the sinner by faith in the Savior. And when he places his faith in the Savior, the righteousness of God is written on his account. Okay, chapter 3, verse 20, after the guilty, he offers this victory. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So there's the offering. And then he keeps writing, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith, of Jesus Christ upon all upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so think about this. you got your name written in heaven. <clears throat> you got your account. He's marking down the sins that you've committed, the sins that we've omitted. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him sin. So the sins of omission all down through there. And when a person places faith in Christ, kind of diagonally, He'll write over those sins, righteousness of God. Okay, that's called imputed righteousness. He puts righteousness on your count in heaven. Okay, that would be chapter 4, verse 5. Now, that's a good deal. It's a good deal. 4, verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted. For righteousness. So that's righteousness across our account. Okay, now there's another thing. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now, even though God's righteousness is written across our sins, our sins are still on the account. And so what he does in chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So on that account, he'll highlight all the sins and delete them. So now the only thing on the account is the righteousness of God. Now, technically, doctrinally, you could actually say, I am as holy as Jesus Christ. Now, now some people are going to look at you like you're nuts. But doctrinally, we could do that. Mike Pearl had a shirt that he would stand out there and say, I'm as righteous as, as, as God. Boy, would he get some talks. Now, doctrinally, that's true. Because that's justification. Okay, now... That's justification. Now, when we get that, chapter 5, verse 9, notice that we're saved from the wrath. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, that's a victory. That's a victory. How do we get it? By faith. Okay, so that's justification. Justification, the victory of justification is provided for every sinner by faith in the Savior. Okay, now there's a step up. Now, what do we do after justification? Okay, that's where Romans 6 steps in. Romans 6, 7, and 8 begins our daily process of life on the earth after justification. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Okay, so this steps into what is called sanctification. Colossians 2, verse 6 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Well, how did I receive Christ Jesus the Lord? By faith. So how do I walk in him? By faith. It's by faith. It's the same thing. That's where sanctification. Now, Romans reveals there's a victory provided for us. 
for the saint by faith in what? The scriptures. It's by faith in what this book says. Why? That's what the Holy Ghost uses to sanctify us, to clean us up. That's what it's a... Basically, this is a twofold application where you believe in the Savior, you receive forgiveness. You believe in the Scriptures, you receive freedom from sin. Both of those are available to the believer. If you would look in Acts 20, verse 32, to verify that sanctification, the light switch for sanctification is faith. That's the light switch. It's believing what the Bible actually says happened to you at the moment you got saved. Justification is what God has done for you and I. Sanctification is what God has done to you and I, the saved individual. Acts 20, 32. Now, brethren, I commend you to God that the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among them, all them that are or which are sanctified. Okay, that's a step that step up. Chapter 26, verse 18. This is the one that shows that it starts by faith. <clears throat> 26, 18. This is the light switch that God it allows the power of God to go through us to say no to sin, to walk away from it. Okay, or to uh, do some things that he wants us to do. Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, for the power of Satan and of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's what God has done for us, for the believer, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. <clears throat> That's what he's done to the believer. That's where the freedom steps in. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The person says, well, I can't help myself. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. The victory is available. It's available to every one of us. The Spirit of God <coughs> uses the Word of God to sanctify us. John 17, 17 is the great prayer that Jesus prays for every believer. You know, if you get a little note from somebody and say, I'm praying for you, that's an encouragement. Okay, but John 17 is the Lord Jesus' text message that he's praying for you. What is he praying for? John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. See, that's how we get cleaned up by the word of God. Our flesh resists the spirit in this realm of sanctification. And when we yield to the flesh, we sin. When we yield to the Spirit, God gives us the power to withstand it, to stand against it. It's the Spirit of God that does that. He uses the Word of God to cleanse us. Ephesians 5, verse 26. This is why the Bible is so important to be reading. Ephesians 5, 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the Word, that he may present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. Okay, so how does this process, how do we trigger it? Okay, you go back to Romans 6, and Paul writes about it in Romans chapter 6. He's dealing with this idea of sanctification or living a holy life after salvation. And so here's what we know, chapter 6, verse 6, Romans. And you believe this. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but... In that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon. Okay, this is a reckoning. <clears throat> this is something that, this is a verse, uh, be good verse to memorize. Okay, this is a verse you want to say out loud when you're tempted. Okay, you catch yourself. And if you want to put a southern twang on there because Paul was a southerner, that's fine and dandy. 
Lucas wouldn't have a hard time with that one, I think, with that twang. <laughs> okay, so likewise reckon yourselves dead to be deed unto sin, and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, so when a temptation hits your way, comes your way, just say, I reckon I'm dead to that. I just reckon it. Out loud. One, one thing you're doing is you're uh, talking to yourself, which is not, you know, totally crazy. It's a sign of the fullness of the Spirit. Okay, you ever see sports players go up to the free throw line or the, the uh, plate and they're mumbling? They're talking to themselves. They're reminding themselves of something. Okay, and so reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Do we believe that? I mean, I'm dead to sin. Three times in Romans 6, it says, I'm free from sin. And then it says, verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, you sit down and watch telly. Reckon yourselves dead to some of the things. And turn the thing off. If it's trash, if it's garbage. Okay, uh, you know, you, you know, you get to start naming programs, but I mean, some of the titles are good enough. Suicide Quad. Isn't that good enough? Suicide? Come on. Suicide? I mean, what do you do? You going to encourage that? I wouldn't encourage that. I know what the family feels like when somebody does that. I mean, that ought to be the title of these things. You don't even have to watch some of this stuff. Just the title is enough to hopefully recognize that, hey, I'm free from that. I'm dead to that. I am dead to sin and alive to God. And when a person recognizes that I'm dead to that, then God will give you a power that's higher than the sin, and then you can resist it. Now, that's Romans 6. Now, Romans 7, he goes through the struggles that he has, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, because that's the struggles we all have. Now, if you would, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Okay, now, this is the sanctification process. Okay, even though it's a declared, decreed, it's a victory that God has available to us, it is our obligation to hit the light switch. Believe it. You say, how does it work? I don't know how it works. I just know it works. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Now, this is a passage that a lot of the born again and again and againers try to show you that somebody can get unsaved. But that's not the, the question is, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay, the question is unrighteous or unsaved people. That's the question. And the answer is, be not deceived, neither fornicators. Now, a saved person can commit that sin, but God says he's not a fornicator. He's not in the sin. He's in Christ. And then it says... Uh, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. That's a big one of our age. Nor effeminate. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's a big one of our age. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, some of you Corinthians, some of you were these things, these people. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. It's the Spirit of God that does it. Okay, so Romans reveals at the beginning that the victory that's offered is justification by believing in the Savior. In Romans 6, 7, 6 and 7, and the beginning part of 8, Paul revealed here that there's a victory offered of sanctification to the believer who believes in the scriptures themselves and yields to the Spirit to help us clean our lives up. Now, Romans 8, about verse 16, he takes it a step up. Okay, some other areas. Because 
The Bible says that, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So there's going to be some suffering coming to the believer, and what is our response going to be? That's where he's picking up in verse 16. Where in verse 16 it says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So don't doubt that. And if children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon, there's that reckoning. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So now the word glory is being shown here. And he's heading this towards glorification. Okay, and this is where we have the redemption of our body. At the moment you got justified, your soul and spirit are redeemed. But our body is still our hang-up. Glorification is when the body is redeemed. Chapter 8, verse 23, you see at the end, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. That's what's called glorification. If you drop down to verse 29, you'll see that he lays it out for us. Glorification is the extradition or translation of the believer to be free from the world. And the reason why I'd say the Lord does it in a moment and twinkling of an eye, because if he did it real slow, some people would throw a hook down and try to keep back down here. And so he's got to do it so fast. Now in verse 28, pretty well known verse, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Okay, pretty well known verse. But the context of this verse 28, is glorification. That's at the judgment seat. I guarantee it. At the judgment seat, we all will wish at that time we suffered more. I guarantee it. I don't wish that now. I don't wish that in this life. But at the judgment seat, I don't want to be in the same line as Richard Wormbrand. I want to be down away from him. I want to be down away from somebody who uh, God chose them to be uh, paralyzed, neck down, and live out their Christian life in a bed. Tremendous suffer, uh, suffering, amazing. I don't want to be in line by that person. I want to be in the line where somebody suffered, maybe they got a paper cut. Maybe the, elect, maybe the air conditioner went out. Okay, that's the line I want to be in. <laughs> okay, but the idea he's bringing it up to suffering. Okay, the redemption of our body. Now, notice in verse 29. Now, our dear folks down in Demont, they have a hard time with predestination. They've got it all confused. Okay, where verse 29, this is the first occurrence of the word. It's only found four times. And notice within the context, the Bible defines itself. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be saved. Now, that's how they read it down in Demont. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, and them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Notice he skipped one. Of the three, he skipped sanctification. And the reason why that's skipped is the promise is, Jesus Christ promised that if you are born again, you will see the kingdom of God. If you are born again, you will enter the kingdom of God. He did not promise an inheritance. That is a part of sanctification. That's that different part. He promised that if you are justified, you will be glorified. What is being glorified? Verse 29 you will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Predestination doesn't deal with justification. It deals with glorification. You see, where the Calvinists will say, God in heaven is saying, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, you can stay and you can go. Okay, where they limit it to justification, but in the context... It's somebody who is already justified. 
they are predestinated to be like Jesus Christ. Okay, predestinated, predestination, forehand destination. Okay, we of our free will chose to buy a train ticket for Lindsay to go see Ashley. Okay, so we chose to buy this ticket. Now, she is predestinated to go to Rochester, New York. The destination is New York. She's not there yet, so it's predestinated, but we bought the ticket. Justification is a person exercising their free will to receive Jesus Christ. Because they got that ticket in Jesus Christ, now they're going to be like him someday. Now, it would be good if we work toward that here on earth through the sanctification process so it's not such a shock treatment when we get to heaven. Okay, but that's what glorification is. All these, the predestinated folks, they're, they're thinking that God is the one that's going to decide who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. No, it's the individual. Are you going to take the victory that's offered by justification? Well, you ought to. Okay, so whoever has experienced justification, according to Romans 8, 29, and 30, will be glorified. They're going to be like Jesus Christ someday. That's the promise. Now, the glorification would be much better, I guess you could say, if we yielded to the Spirit of God and hit the switch for sanctification where an inheritance came with it. Okay, but in Romans 8, the reason why he brings this up is that, yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, it might be, this might be surprising to some Christians, but the world doesn't like you. The world hates the believer. Satan hates the believer. And your flesh, which was crucified, doesn't like the idea and has these desires that wants you to take care of it. It wants attention. Okay? And so there's our enemies. And so in that process, we're going to have some things that happen to us that we're not going to like. Some suffering. We're going to be wrong. Why did this happen to me? It's because you're breathing. That's why. You see, now in Romans 8, notice in verse 37, the conclusion is you can be more than a conqueror. Not just a conqueror. More than. How do we get to that more than? Well, we are a conqueror because of justification and sanctification. When we yield to those two. But when we live our lives in sanctification and we make glorification better, then we step up and we can deal with the sufferings of life. I can't believe they did that to me. Like we're exempt from suffering? Uh, it's when a person feels sorry for themselves and they wallow in self-pity of what took place. Oh, I'm just... I just can't believe. We're not a conqueror. We're defeated when that happens. Justification is rejected by the one who places themselves above the Savior. Sanctification is rejected by the one who places themselves above the Spirit. And when we pity ourselves, we have placed ourselves above God. If you go back and look at some of the men of the Bible, who did God choose to write about in the Bible? Joseph. Can you imagine Joseph? His brothers ruined his life, sold him into slavery. I mean, he was pretty soft up until this time. Went down to Egypt. What if Joseph would have wallowed in self-pity and refused to interpret the dreams of the butler Baker and Pharaoh. He would have died in prison. He would have died in prison. But then you see at the end in Genesis 50, he forgave his brothers. Now, he'd already done that and took care of them. What about the little maid of Naaman? The little girl that was taken from her family, taken away from her parents, become a slave or a maid or a bond servant to Naaman, an army captain who caused the battle 
and his wife, and he heard, she heard her mistress, her masteress, or whatever you want to call her, crying because Naaman was suffering from leprosy. If she wallowed in self-pity, she could stay in a room and say, Good, I'm glad he's suffering. Look what he did to me. She could have, oh man, kept her mouth shut totally and enjoyed the pain of Mrs. Naaman and Naaman because he's the rascal that took me from my family. But no, what'd she do? She offered hope to him. She helped him out. He got healed amazingly. He came to the God of the Old Testament. David could have never accepted the forgiveness of God in his sin. And the murder of Uriah, as Bathsheba's grandfather took it to the grave and committed treason against David and then subsequently died. How about Daniel? Daniel was taken from his family as a teenager, put under the authority of Melzar. If Daniel would have wallowed in self-pity and said, I can't even have a child someday. They took any hope of me having a Mary, having a family. They ruined my life, and I'm mad at them. And then when Melzar came along and said the king had a dream and he wants to know an answer, he would have said, no way, I ain't going to do that. I hate them for what they did to me. He would have died in the death sentence in Daniel 2. We would not even have Daniel 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, up to 12. He stepped out of that. I have a daughter that's in Australia. Can't come home. She amazes me. With her limited income, she has purchased 20,000 chick tracks. Two separate occasions, 10,000 and 10,000. About 1,000 bucks each time. And is providing chick tracks for her church and witnessing for her Savior. And is stuck there for eight years and going on, and there's no hope of her not getting out. But she hasn't lost her faith in the Lord. She could wallow in self-pity. She don't have to. I do a lot for her. (laughs) But it amazes me. It amazes me how God can give the grace that's needed through suffering. Her glorification, I want to be down the line from hers, from what she's gone through. And we don't tell people a lot of things that happens. You know, we just are so thankful for Skype that we could talk to her. What about somebody that I'll mention in here? I shouldn't, but I will. Joe Kenning. Before he was two years old, he got run over by a lawnmower. Clipped a kneecap. How many surgeries he's went through? You know, trying to ride a bicycle. You ever tried to ride a bicycle with a straight leg? It didn't stop him. I don't hear him griping about it. Maybe Kirsten does. I don't know. But But it doesn't slow him down. He's on the basketball court with us. I mean, you've got to admire that. I mean, he could wallow in self-pity, be mad at God. And what would happen? Only he will be living in his bitterness. You see, this Romans 8 thing where we can be more than a conqueror. We can step up higher than a conqueror because of this victory God has allowed for us. The believer has been given the victory of justification and sanctification as a conqueror. When forgiveness has been given to me and freedom from sin are experienced. But the one who is more than a conqueror is the one who is able to offer the same forgiveness and freedoms to others, possibly the ones who caused our suffering. Ephesians 4, verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. And put all 
bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's when we step into that more than a conqueror, Romans chapter 8. And that's only done by the Spirit of God. And when we step in that realm, then the glorification, boy, that is going to be a phenomenal thing. The glorification. And it's all victories that the Lord has provided for all of us. And the thing is, is hit the switch. Believe it. Let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to understand these ideas and help us to recognize that the world does hate us. Our flesh is our constant problem. And Lord, by chance, if somebody in here is not saved, that they'd recognize there's a victory provided for them in its faith in Jesus Christ. And the ones who are saved and are struggling about some things, I pray you'd help us to recognize there's a victory that's provided for us. It's a freedom from sin. And we could step into that faith by believing your words. And of course, the glorification, that's your part. But we can make it a little bit better by fulfilling our part of the sanctification process. And Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to be more than conquerors. Where heads are bowed and eyes are closed, the piano will play, the altar's open. If you need it, it's available. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to see the great victories that are offered to us. And I pray you'd help us to believe them and access the faith. We ask you for the faith so that we might be more than conquerors through Jesus that loved us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.